Say hello. Hello. Hey. What's, up? What's you doing, buddy? Say we're playing pirates. <gasps> All right. All right. So, Dave. What's up, man? We ended yesterday with the most anticipated Oklahoma City Thunder season in history. Sure. And we know that that carries a lot of weight going back to all those things I don't want to talk about right now. But (laughs) um, now we get to see some more stuff international FIBA style. Yeah. And it really gets me pumped up. For sure, dude. For sure. I know. I know Australia lost to Brazil in this friendly. So people will be like, oh, well, you know, they're not, um, they're not as good as everybody hoped or whatever. But actually, like, you want to be challenged in friendlies. You want to be in a position where the team has a chance to learn. And this experience for, for our, one of our young future players for the Thunder, for Josh Giddy, is so fucking critical. Hmm. It's everything. So I just have this very strong sense that um, when you look at Shea, what he's doing, Josh Giddy, what he's doing, the fact that J-Dub and Chet are on the select team, they're up and coming. Um, we've never seen anything like this. No. And I, I mean, it's, it's hard to find a team in, in the recent history, and I say recent history and forever, that we've seen a, a team like this, man. Like, I think it starts with, you look at the unselfish play that these players play with. Right. And you understand that this, this, this team isn't just a bunch of ISO players, you know, in the past when the, they've had super teams and working at those super teams, you know, it's quite difficult. Um, But doing it this way is, is a lot more fun because if you think about it, um, if Scotty Pippen had gone and played with, um, you know, Clyde Drexler, you know, and those guys, what's up, Jared? Greasy. Um, (laughs) yeah, <laughs> dude, it's fucking greasy morning every greasy morning, man. morning, dude. Oh, right, I gotta go back to that before I get oh, any further. Oh, okay. I wanna, but we gotta greasy, get back to Clyde Drexler. We gotta get back whenever we're done that. The the greasy though, man. Um, every single time I think of us being greasy, I think of um, um the Trailer Park Boys. Oh you yeah, know, the Canadian TV show where they have yes. bubbles and bubbles is always like greasy. Mm. Anyways, every right. single time, every single time I think about us being greasy, that's what I think about. So, um, anyways, um. But you think about the, the, the team atmosphere that these guys play in and, and raising them this way, I, I think is way more powerful. Like we got a glimpse of what happens when you raise a team like a team the last time around. We ran into some situations, obviously, uh, with KD and Russ, uh, but those situations can be avoided for future. And how do we avoid those for future is by making sure that we don't have a, a media that pits e- those two players against each other. Unk. Oh, Dave, yes, guys. yes, you're right about that. The media, but it was it was national media too. You know, I go back. It was it was interesting because the um the series against the Spurs, I forget the year. Um, I think it was 2015. What up, Caleb? What's up, Caleb? Um, yes. What's up, man? How you doing, man? Very, very good. So I was talking. Yes. I was mentioning you're about good, this man. um the series where we lost to the Spurs. Um, we had, see, we going back, we had won four games in a row after getting down 2 0, right? And then a few years later, we're up against the Spurs again, and we, Ibaka starts out not playing the series. He comes back. We got down 2 0. We won the next two, and it looked like we might be able to run the table. Um, I went back and watched the final elimination game where the Spurs beat us. I think they went on to win the championship that year. And they, Steve Kerr was on the announce, he was announcing for ABC, or whatever, right? And he's just sitting there being like, how come KD didn't touch the ball in the last possession? How come this? And how come that? And he was just like, so it wasn't just the local media. Sure. My point is, it was like Stephen A. Smith. It was Skip Bayless. Everybody was going after Russ, saying Russ is trash. He should be giving the ball to KD for every shot. You know, and that's, that's, that was just, that was every bit of media. Caleb, is that how you remember it too? Yeah, yeah, it is. I think at that time, because uh, let's see, was KD had been MVP at that point, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think at that point, and Russ hadn't been, it was like, you have to give the ball to the former MVP, the leading scorer, the most efficient guy. Right. And, you know, yeah, Russ was a little bit notorious already for, you know, poor decision-making at the end of the game. And just almost like he was his own worst enemy in terms of too much effort. Um, but man, I mean, my memory is that like, I mean, I don't want to say neither of them were that clutch, but I mean, I, I go back to the, 
2016 series against the Warriors where it was like game six and seven. They just, they didn't show up, you know, so both of them. Well, I, I call that the uh, Draymond Green effect. Um, <laughs> let's just be honest. The, the recruitment had fully started at that moment. <laughs> And uh, Draymond Green was um, into uh, Katie's head more than we'll ever know. I think looking at how that translates <laughs> to now, right, is like the pecking order. You know, I feel like the pecking order is something that's sort of established and they're okay with. So it's it's okay for Josh Giddy to go be the best player on his national team and SGA to be the best player on his national team. And then for them to all come back together and play at the Thunder where they understand their role. Sure. Um, I feel like those things were always like, well, you draft, like we always explained away the young players of the Thunder not getting along is you draft them young and they'll figure it out. You have Thunder and you have Lightning and they'll have to figure it out. But it's, but this team already just like on paper fits. And then on top of that, you see what they're doing for their national team. It's just like, holy shit. It gets me so fucking stoked. Man, you guys are watching the Giddy highlights? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It's like, this is different. This is a different version of Giddy. And I know that the, but it's so similar to what he's already playing, though. It's different, but, you know, but like, similar. The Boomers study the Thunder to see what he did right. I know the Thunder are going to come back and study the Boomers because he's playing so much better. So it's going to feed into it because they'll be like, oh, well, I don't know he could do it that way. You know, like, this is it's going to build on top of it. What are you noticing, Caleb? Um, he seems, first of all, more assertive. And I think he's getting downhill with more momentum. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so he's I'm seeing him... Corner. He's turning the corner fast. I've I've actually been pretty surprised at how fast and quick he looks out there. And I think the second part of that is I think he's gaining that momentum Hmm. sooner, right? So it's like he's crossing that half court mark going downhill. He's already made a decision, bring the ball up the court. He's getting to the bucket. I I don't think we really saw that from him last year on the Thunder. You know, it was like he was playing within the half court offense. He was facilitating the half court offense. In moments, he was picking his spots, getting downhill, hitting the floater, going straight to the bucket, doing that kind of uh, like unathletic spin move that he kind of does that still works so well. Mm. Now, though, what I'm seeing with him in the FIBA tournament so far and just these kind of like warm-up um, exhibition matches pretty much, he just mm-hmm. looks way more assertive. It looks like he's made up his mind. And that's probably honestly coming from the coach, just being like, we want mm. you to be our best player. Get You're downhill, right. r- run this, you know? So, um Maybe last thing I'll say in this, I know you guys have talked about like who's going to be our second best player on offense. And it's kind of a toss up. Is it going to be Giddy? Is it going to be um, Chet? Is it going to be J Dub? It's up for grabs. And, hmm. you know, right. it's like he has that potential to carry this style of play into the season with the Thunder. And that'd be fucking epic. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's what I'm getting pumped up about too. Man, I, I, I think, you know, it's. It's exciting to be able to see Josh Giddy do what he's doing, but really the progression. Um, what's up, Sammy Dog? What's uh, up, Sammy? Sammy. Um, but the progression of what you were saying is he's he's attacking downhill before he gets you know even to um, half court. But one thing that he would do last year is he would you know when he would get down low and on dribble uh, when he, he would have a bunch of guys around him and he'd do that really really low dribble and get really low to the ground. Um, I'm noticing when he does that he gets his shoulder lower now. Mm-hmm. And he attacks from that moment. Loads out of it, and it's and it's something that I, I I've I've watched in a lot of players um, through the years that are small point guards learn this move, but I've never seen a six nine plus player learn this move like this. And he yeah. gets so low, and then he explodes off of that. And it's just like, you know, of course he's playing against uh, you know FIBA competition, so some of the competition he's been playing against isn't NBA competition, but I don't see there's there's going to be a very much of a change from that explosion that he has like that. And, and it, to me, I, I look at it and I, I say, it's, it's going to be elite this next year. Mm-hmm. And how far is he going to take that? Well, that's up to Josh Giddy and the coaching staff. I mean, we have so many good players and which the second best player going to be on this team. I don't know, but can we have three players that average 20 points? Yes. It's not going to be always pretty, but we will have three players that could average 20 points is in, and that's because Josh has, has upped his game in such a way that we're seeing it right in front of us. And, you know, it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about is Josh. It's crazy. This is an incredible summer. Um, we don't get summers like this mm. every decade. So no. it's hard not to get too pumped up right now. You're absolutely right, man. I mean, absolutely right. And I listen, FIBA got me thinking about it today. And, and I cannot tell you how excited I am 
for FIBA this year, Olympics the next year, and Josh Giddy's, you know, progression through the years is because we, we think about it now. We, we think about the Kobe effect that Kobe has on all these young players. Um, in 20 years, there's going to be guys mm-hmm. coming to the league that are called Josh. That going to be like 18, 19-year-old kids coming into the league, and they're going to be called Josh because their parents watched Josh Giddy play and dominate the NBA for so many years. And then they're going to be wearing Josh's signature shoe, and they're going to be wearing Josh's number. <laughs> you know, like, like, and, and this is insane to me. This is why I get so excited is because we talk about the Andrew Gaze effect with the Australian players and every player says what when they're interviewed? Well, I really watched Andrew Gaze through my life and I watched how he, you know, was able to do this and this and I pulled away and I was able to implement in my own career. That's what Josh Giddy's going to be doing to these young players coming up. And to me, that's one of the most powerful things is because like we're, we're watching in the middle of this, this revolution of the game. And what do we have? We have one of the best young point guards that the game has seen in a long, long time. Yeah, long it's, time, man. It's exciting, man. Yo, Caleb, um, tell me, what do you think Josh will do for his stats this, up, this coming year? Um, points, assists, rebounds, what are you thinking? Well, what, this last year he put up like 16, 8, and 6, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Around there. His, <laughs> right. his second year in the league, age 20. My oh, God, yeah, it's man. so sick, um, man. So, yeah, I mean, he... Look, he might even still be growing a little bit, like literally physically. Um, he looks bigger. <laughs> His muscles, man. I, he does look bigger, yeah. I mean, he put on a lot of, lot of size going into last season, I felt. And I feel like it's kind of that same dynamic taking place again. Um, I think it's pretty reasonable to expect. Uh, I think it depends on who takes that second scoring option. Let's say we don't know if it's Giddy, right? Um, yeah. But I think Josh could step in at like an 18, 10, and like 8 or 7 kind of guy, right? So I think he could average a double-double on the assist That's side. Amazing. I expect to see I him agree. take a big step up there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the scoring doesn't improve too much. And most likely, those extra points are going to come from more efficient three-point shooting is my best guess. I, I agree. And I think he's learning how to get to the foul line and create that contact, at least what mm. I'm seeing in FIBA. Um, and that his- could help out. His passing, you know, obviously to get to 10 assists, I mean, that puts you into that elite category. We think he's an elite passer, but you got to be like a consistent elite playmaker throughout the course of every game. But you watch what he's doing in FIBA, and I'm not saying it's as good as Luca, the cross court, left hand, right hand, off the dribble passes and all that stuff. But like you can see, he's starting to scratch that surface of like, like being a playmaker who can thread the needle no matter what and you can't help off of. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, then you get to 10 assists pretty quickly. He had some sick passes in the exhibition game last night against Brazil. Um, mm, yeah. Just from everywhere, dude. Like, from the three-point line, in the mid-post, down low off the driving dish. He was just – he was – I was looking at him and I was two-handed. like – Yeah, exactly. I was like, he's not, a, he's not like a three-level scorer. He's a three-level playmaker. You know, like, people talk about being a three-level scorer from – you know, the three-point line, the mid-range, and then, you know, getting above the rim, right? They're downhill. And it's like, you know, he could have that. I wouldn't necessarily call him a, a, a good three-point scorer by any sense of the imagination. Um, but he's a, three, he's a three-level playmaker 100%. He's a, he's a threat anywhere on the court to make the right play. And one thing I also noticed last night, because I watched the full game highlights, not just the giddy highlights, he had a lot of those, like, hockey assists. So passing mm-hmm. to the assister, right? So it's like... You know, even if he's not directly responsible for the bucket that gets made, he makes the pass and the play to facilitate that bucket. Mm. Yeah. Right. It's the I love the hockey assist, man. I love it. It's yeah. It's a lost art form in the NBA, and I think that we we watched a lot happen uh, with the early Celtics um, dominations, where you know the hockey assist, assist was something that they went to a lot. Uh, but I feel like the Thunder they they really design their offense around that. It's the setup mm. play, you know, it's the setup pass. It's the, the, uh, and, and sometimes in the offense, you even see it with Dort, you know, the play is going well, the setup play is there. The ball gets to Dort instead of Dort making that easy pass for a wide open three, Dort attacks the hole, you know, yeah. that's when I've noticed it the most, you know, because yep. it's such a well-formed offense that it just goes, goes and goes. And when it doesn't go perfectly, you notice it. And I love it like that because I mean, <laughs> our offense is, is, is next level. And think about the leadership. Like, that's one thing Smith was mentioning yesterday, un- underrated leadership. But Josh has never been in a situation where he had this many experienced leaders around him. That's mm-hmm. my opinion. 
I mean, somebody could probably say there's an exception to that, but you're talking about Joe Ingles, Patty Mills, um, even guys like Dyson Daniels can teach Josh something about the game. Like every single guy on that team, um, Jack White, you know, he's sitting there and he's like a captain at Duke, but they all look at him and they say, Josh, you're going to lead this thing. And by the way, we have the experience that we've been there and we can guide you through that, but you're the leader and we're going to teach you how to lead. And then he's going to come back with like, I mean, it's like getting fucking Eagle Scout with Boy Scouts and then coming back. And like, you know what I mean? This is, this is significant for his leadership, which was already under, underrated. And I, I just, it's hard for me not to think that like, personally, that he's the 20 point score coming back into the league because of the way he's looking for his shot. Like, but you know, he's got a lot to prove in FIBA. Um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be different. And you know, What's in my opinion, this loss was actually a good thing for them as a team because that locker room is saying we got to get better. And if they take every possession more seriously against every team, they have a chance to win it all. But that's going to come down to the fact that you need a 20 year old to be the most mature player out on the court. And yeah. that's, that's cool. Yeah, man, I was watching some uh, defensive sets and this is one of the things that, um, you know, throw back to Caleb in a second here, but, um, I feel like Josh's game, and, and there's a lot of underrated aspects to Josh's game. But I personally feel like the most underrated aspect to Josh's game is his defense. And the fact that he can go up and play against the point guard straight up, you know, stay in front of his, his guard, or he can drop down into that middle of that zone on defense in that, that center position. Um, if you look about the way that our, our defense is designed in that team atmosphere defense, um, he is probably the most underrated defender defensive player on our team and that's how i feel about him and he's he's super just incredibly knowledgeable where to be where to go at and it's not about the steal it's about looking at the shot and realizing where the ball is going and getting to that spot off the ball um, off the rim that josh does it's so next level but what do you Kalo, feel like that uh is so um underrated about josh's game um that's a good question i haven't really thought of that to be honest the most underrated part of Josh's game. I'll tell you what my, probably what my favorite part is. He's got one of the okay. cleanest floaters I've seen, and especially for being 20 years old. I think it's a pretty rare skill. So yeah, I like as that. He becomes, as he becomes more of a threat with that momentum going downhill, if he could just stop and pop kind of thing in terms of hitting that floater, I think that's yeah. going to open up the offense a lot and open up the paint for sure. Um, one thing I did want to say also about last night, because, yeah, they did lose. One of the things that I've lo I've, I was thinking about after watching those highlights is this is such an amazing opportunity for Josh to grow as a player yeah. and as a top option on a team. Because yep. their last play of the game got scrambled, and he had the ball with just a few seconds left. And he had to basically chalk up that three that was, you know, mm. really tight offense right up on him. He was a little bit he off balance. Out. He was fouled. Yeah, he could he could have been. But it's like, dude, just getting comfortable with those uncomfortable scenarios. Because he he's not going to have those opportunities with OKC like last year. Because you give the ball to Shea and you let him go. You let him go to work, right? But yeah. on this international squad where he's the guy, he's going to be put in those scenarios that he hasn't necessarily had the opportunity to this high level of a game that – this is exactly what we want for him now coming back to OKC. It's like, okay, try to put up those last minute threes, try to get to the hill, try to make the right play in the last minute, right? Or the last seconds, the last possession of the game. And like, as an OKC fan, I want to see him mess those up because the more he messes those up, the more he learns to get them right when he's with the squad that we actually care about, right? Because like, respectively, I don't give a shit about the Australian basketball team. I just want to see Josh ball out, right? It's like, that's all I want. Sure. Right. I watching, right. watching his growth that way is exactly yeah. right. Where we're like, it, it reminds me of the old Michael Jordan thing we used to hear about. Like I missed, you know, a hundred shots before right. I made a you know, game winner. I'm missing, messing it up, but Dave, go ahead. You've covered me now. No, no, no. You're good. I was just, I was just <laughs> recognizing what's up, Joseph. Uh, welcome. And then Jared, uh, he was saying Josh is uh, most um, underrated aspect is his rebounding. Um, so uh, nice, mm. Josh. Uh, um, Jared, I mean, uh, nice. definitely, you know, one of the things I want to throw in there too, is that, um, I, I really, you know, Caleb, what you're saying with this floater is, you know, I've heard maybe one other person talk about Josh's floater. So that's an incredibly underrated aspect of Josh's game because 
not enough people are really dissecting what he is able to do in his size that he's able to do that with and how he releases the ball, gets the guy on his hip, um, sometimes jumps, sometimes doesn't. Um, sometimes it looks like a jump shot. Sometimes it's a natural floater or a finger roll. Like he has so many dis- different versions of just that one move. Um, mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right, dude. Like he is is going to really keep on stepping it up. And and it's only going to get better when you have yeah. the lob pass to Chet. Yeah. And you have the, yeah. the, the deep three-point shots coming from Jada, who I believe can be a 40% shooter. I think Isaiah Joe is going to be up there too. I think this team is really designed to be a, a, a team that's, surrounding josh giddy and if you look at it and and, and you look at the point of all attack and even a optical illusion there's always a center of the optical illusion you know like and and we can say look at shay look at jw look at all these other players but the center of this optical illusion is happening in oklahoma city is josh giddy and that's what's Mm -hmm. so impressive and what's so fun to be able to watch about this team so you can say hi to everybody hi what's up buddy all right. Hey, Daddy, can I have a snack with my lunch? Uh, yes. I'll have a snack give, with my lunch. <laughs> right. Yo, I have, a, I have a question for you guys. All what right. is, what is like, the pick and roll combination you guys are most excited for with Chet? Mark, you go first, man. I, I, know you I was saying, it, yeah, it was Josh <laughs> and Chet for sure. But, mm. but one thing that I was thinking about since I used that yesterday, and I just would re- repeat myself a lot, I would say J-Dub and Chet. <laughs> could be pretty significant because yeah. you're gonna get dunked on if if you don't play it just <laughs> right you're gonna get dunked on bro think about it like this we've got the dunk factor we've got the lethal mid-range factor if you go pick and roll with uh chet and shay um mm-hmm. you've got the dunk factor with j-dub and chet you know like chet himself <laughs> you know like set a screen on himself and roll um but if you think about it if you think about it, though, like, in all honesty, is that I think Chet is going to up one player's value more than anybody else's on the floor, and that's Dort's. Hmm. Dort loves to attack the hole. And if you get Dort on the right person and you get the right mm. situation, Dort is going to look really fucking filthy. And yeah. I really believe Dort and, and Chet are going to have this unique com- you know, connection similar to a Kenny Hustle and a um uh who was his uh uh josh giddy and kenny hustle the way that they would connect you know like there was this one time that that um kenny hustle shay and josh were on the floor all right and uh kenny hustle does this crazy backdoor cut it was like a double backdoor cut right and josh giddy just hits him on the money on the cut right and he just smiles going down the court pointing at josh and the next time Shea comes down and does a crazy backdoor cut and Shea finishes it and dunks it two-handed, right? He kind of looks over at Josh on the rim and then points to Josh and gets this big old smile on his face and looks over at Kenny Hustle. And Kenny Hustle looks at him and goes, I fucking told you, man. <laughs> right? And it's like this like idea that, like again, Josh is that center of the optical illusion in Oklahoma City of everybody's so focused on Shea and J-Dub and Chet, you know? But the Josh, and then you have all these other guys that when you add Chet into this mix that we've already seen what these guys can do as guards, then you throw Chet into that mix and then you're saying pick and screen or screen and rolls with Chet and J dub and Chet and Shay. And do we really honestly know what the value of Chet is going to be into adding onto this team? Do we really know? Because like, it seems like he could be one of those guys that scores what five buckets a game off a of pick and roll done properly by an alley-oop, by an easy bucket, without, without doing much. And if that's, create as many as that, too. And, and yeah. offensive boards. You know, like, yeah. how many, like, what is, it, what is he going to add to this team that's going to separate us from everybody else? And I think that's where it comes down to, is, like, what I'm seeing with Chet, right, already against KD. You know, it's not that KD is not scoring on him. It's the fact that his, his release... KD's release is right here, and here's Chet right here, and it's like inches away, you know? And that's what's exciting is because you're seeing this young man that's playing against the best players in the world right now, and he's making it look easy. And he's also a great passer, too. Like, Chet doesn't get enough credit. And I know a lot of people are, are down on him because, yeah, he hasn't looked as fluid since his injury, but anybody who's ever been injured, and I haven't really ever taken time out of, like, anything for injury, right? So I don't really understand how long it takes back, but I've never seen somebody come back 
and not look a little shaky when they first come back. So it takes time. I think he'll get that fluidity back. But some people are saying that he's not quite there yet. I mean, I understand why, but like, it's not going to take long for him to be a better player than he was before the injury. Because from what I've seen, and it's just, it's going to, when he gets back that fluidity, he's already going to be a better player for just being stronger and having more um, knowledge about the, the game from, from experiencing it on the sidelines. Man, I agree. I agree. It's going to be fun this year. Watching Chet mature the videos, watching uh, Josh Giddy be the leader watching Shea be the leader, you know, I, again, you cannot, I mean, even Poku, if he's playing out there, like these guys are, are having an opportunity to see what they can do with their countries. And after being so like, you know, focused on the Oklahoma city thunder, you know, like this next year is going to be no exception with the Olympics on the horizon, you know, like these guys are ready to go. And I, again, it's, we can only speculate because we don't really know what this team can do, but, if this team stays healthy, I don't, I mean, I hate to put a number on it. I really do. Because if this team stays healthy, it's, it's going to cause problems throughout the league. You know, the depth, the defense, the offensive um, pace. You've got, you know, Chet, who is a massive inside presence, which our weakest um, defense aspect last year was the inside, you know, defense, you know, block shots and, and, and mm-hmm. making sure that we, you know, change shots to the inside. Now, with Chet there, like, what is our defense going to look like? And and again, I love the fact that we're, you know, Caleb's asking, like, pick and rolls and, you know, Chet this, Chet that, because uh, we can, I, I don't, I just don't know. Like, I wish we got to see him play with his team last year because I think it would have been mm-hmm. a, a better understanding of where this team's going to go. But the reality is, is that I think it's going to be a very wide awakening situation for everybody else around. And 82 and 0, Unc, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Hey, oh, I'm Jared, talking. enjoy the Def Leppard and Alice Cooper, man. Hell, and Motley Crue. Hell yeah, dude. Fuck yeah. Paul says, got it going tonight. Um, Dave, I got to bounce a little bit early. Um, All right, man. Sounds so, good, dude. Caleb, as always, it's been great joining you. Um, yeah, stick on here. Make sure we get you uploaded all the way. So we will uh, we love you guys in the chat. Sammy, Jared, yes. everybody. Everybody. Um, Joseph. See you guys later. See you soon, Corey.